We begin our worship with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have called, gathered, enlightened, and kept us in the one true faith. Help us through your Holy Spirit to see the many dangers that surround us. Forgive us when we endanger our own souls by flirting with idolatrous temptations, heeding the counsel of the ungodly, and taking pleasure in the ways of the world. Grant us wisdom to know what is the best for us and to turn away from those things which are harmful. Be with us especially today as we gather here in your name so that we might receive the encouragement and the comfort that our souls so urgently need. To you, the only wise God, be honor and glory now and forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll be following the order of service on page 12 and following in the front of the worship supplement. This morning, as we continue on in our theme of Trinity, the Trinity season, and the Lord's work in our lives, we're reminded of the work and the power of the Holy Spirit, who works through the Word of God in order to bring light to our sin-darkened hearts and lives. And it is that Word of God which the Lord pours out on us abundantly that we might receive true life with him in eternity. We begin our worship service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and to serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserved only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray. 
Have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven you all of your sins. By the perfect life and the innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May the Lord give us strength to live according to his will. Amen. Lord God, in love you have prepared wonderful blessings that surpass our understanding. Pour into our hearts that love that we also might love you above all things. Lead us in true faith to your eternal promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, ever one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading for this morning is found recorded in Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 23. When sin entered the world, as recorded by Moses in Genesis, it changed everything. It changed not only human life, but it changed even the world in which humans dwell in, the perfect world which God created. As we look through these verses, the Apostle Paul reminds us that human beings and the world, the creation as a whole, struggles under the burden of sin, which he calls birth pangs. But he also points us ahead to a time when the glory of the Lord will be revealed, when sin will be defeated, and the new creation will be made new once again. We read from Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption the redemption of our body. 
A gospel reading from Luke chapter 17 also reminds us that we live in a sinful world. And in these verses, Jesus speaks to his disciples about the importance in this fallen world of forgiveness towards one another. The disciples realize that that's difficult. As Jesus speaks about forgiving constantly our brother, over and over again in the same day, they realize that they need to ask for a greater faith to be able to do that very thing and to then model what God has done for us, forgiving us for our sins. We read from Luke chapter 17, beginning with verse 1. Then he, that is Jesus, said to the disciples, It is impossible that no offenses should come. But woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. So the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. <coughs> and which of you, having a servant plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and sit down and eat? But will he not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise you, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. Here ends our gospel reading. Please rise. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. we'll be using the words of the Nicene Creed to confess our faith. You can find this on page 5 in the front of the hymnal. As we join to make confession of our faith, we're reminded of the many blessings that our triune God has bestowed upon us. Namely, those through the work of the Holy Spirit, through the Word, in bringing us to faith and to give us the hope of that glory that is yet to come. We join to make confession of our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, 
who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. We'll continue with the singing of hymn 416. God, which has been chosen for our meditation this morning, is found recorded for us in Psalm 119, verses 9 through 16. The psalmist writes, How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. O let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. This is the Word of God. Please be seated. In the name of our Savior Jesus, who is wisdom from God and the Word who was made flesh in order to redeem us from sin and from death, the fellow redeemed. Psalm 119 is the longest psalm in the hymnal of the Old Testament. In fact, it's the longest chapter in all of Scripture. And there's a unique feature about Psalm 119 that you might have noticed as we read through just the eight verses of our text. This psalm, which is 176 verses long, is a psalm in its entirety about the Word of God, the blessing of God's Word and how we so desperately need it as human beings. In the 176 verses of Psalm 119, God's word is spoken of more than once per verse. 
We see just a little bit of that in the verses of our text. Now, in order to see that, we have to realize that he doesn't always use words that we're familiar with or associate with the word of God. There is one in the opening verse. How can a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to your word? But notice in each one of the verses how there is a synonym for God's word in each verse. In verse 10, commandments. In verse 11, word. Verse 12, statutes. Verse 13, judgments. Verse 14, testimonies. Verse 15, precepts and ways. And verse 16, statutes and again, word. Every single one of those nouns is a synonym for God's word, the treasure that he has offered to us and which is something that we need so much in our lives. Before we actually dig into the text, I'd like you to think about God's people in the Old Testament. When we think about and read about the story of God's plan of salvation throughout the Old Testament, sometimes we look back on the Old Testament books and we say, well, you know, that's really not important for us as New Testament believers. It's just history. It's not that important. But the history of God's people in the Old Testament is important, not only for us as Christians, but for all people. It tells the story of God's plan of salvation and how he planned and used individuals throughout history in order to bring about that plan of salvation for all people. But in addition to that, the story of God's people in the Old Testament is also a picture of our lives as New Testament believers. God's plan for his Old Testament people, if you go all the way back to the book of Genesis and in particular the book of Exodus, his plan for his Old Testament people was to bring them to the promised land of Canaan. The promise that he had made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to all of the descendants that followed. Now you remember the story. The Lord brought them out of Egypt through 10 great plagues. He made a covenant with them at Mount Sinai. They journeyed up to the land of promise. They sent in 12 spies, one from each one of the, the families of Jacob. But 10 of those spies came back and said, we can't conquer this land, we're not strong enough. And even though Joshua and Caleb, the other two spies said, we can do this, the Lord can defeat these nations, the people listened to the 10 spies and they said, we can't do it, we're not gonna go in and take this land. And as a result, the Lord judged that generation to 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. He said, this generation won't inherit that land, but the next generation will have an opportunity. For the next 40 years, the Lord guided and led his people through a pillar of fire and cloud, protecting them from the sun in the daytime and giving them warmth in the cool of the night, providing them food with manna and quail, giving them water to drink out of rocks, making sure that their clothing didn't wear out. And why did he do all of that? because he wanted to bring them back to that promised land of Canaan. Now, there were a lot of struggles along the way, and those struggles started early on. While they're at Mount Sinai, and Moses is up on the mountain talking to God, the people say, we don't know if he's coming back. Aaron, build us a god. And he made them a golden calf that they worshiped. Over the next 40 years, the struggles continued. Sometimes they were sick and tired of the food that God provided for them. Sometimes they, they struggled against foreign nations that were more powerful than they were. Sometimes they just got fed up with being in the wilderness and they complained against God and against Moses. But through it all, God's plan was to bring them out of the wilderness and into that land of promise, which is exactly what he did. Think about the parallel to our lives. It isn't any different for us today, is it? God's plan, not only for his people, but for all people whom he has created, is for us ultimately to get to the promised land of heaven. That's his desire. That is his goal for us. And just like the children of Israel struggled and faced temptations and dangers and rebellion against God, so also we, as we journey through the wilderness of this life, 
we too face temptations and dangers and struggles. And at times we fail. At times God delivers us. His goal ultimately being to get us to that eternal kingdom, which he has prepared for us through the death of his son on the cross. Most of the children of Israel didn't make it through the wilderness and into the promised land. And as sad as it is, the same is true today. That the majority of people in the world today aren't going to make it to the promised land that God has prepared for them. Jesus tells his disciples, wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. That illustration of God's people in the Old Testament and the reality that we are wandering in the same wilderness today with God's plan, his desire bringing, being to bring us out of this world of sin to eternity lays a foundation for the importance of our text for today. These eight four short verses emphasize that this is God's desire for us to bring us out of the wilderness, out of the journey, the pilgrimage of this life to eternity. And he guides us and he directs us and he protects us and he feeds us just like he did his Old Testament people through his word. When the children of Israel neglected the word of God and failed to heed it, to hear it, to be blessed by it, they fell away. They fell into temptation. They fell into rebellion. But when they heard the word, when they listened to the word, when they delighted in the word, then they saw the blessings that God eagerly blessed them with. The verses of our text, we're taking a look at this emphasis of God's word and that it is the Christian's joy. It brings us the joy that we need as sinful human beings. God's word brings us that joy by first of all connecting us with God and his blessings. And secondly, it does the same thing and as it gives us these blessings, we're reminded that it deserves our careful contemplation and regular use. We pray that the Holy Spirit would bless our study of these eight verses of Psalm 119. The psalmist here emphasizes one of the blessings of God's word being that it connects us to God and the blessings that he offers to us. In the opening two verses of our text, the psalmist says, how can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. We've probably all heard people who have commented, well, I feel closer to God when I'm out in nature rather than sitting in church. Well, there's a couple of problems with that statement. First of all, it starts off with, I feel. Feelings are always a little bit dangerous. But while we can see the example of God in the creation, what we call the natural knowledge of God, it's limited in what it tells us about God. It can tell us that God is powerful, that he's great, but it tells us nothing about God's plan of salvation for us. There are things that we can learn from sitting out in creation and looking at the miraculous beauty of the world around us. But at the same time, as we see the beauty of the world around us, as we sit somewhere in the forest and we see the butterflies fluttering through or that deer silently walking through, there's also examples where we can sit on the savanna and we can see the cheetah or the lion come out and tear that deer to pieces and realize we live in a fallen world. It's not as beautiful as it always seems to be because of sin. And we live in that fallen world. The Lord reminds us that in church, which is the closest place that we can get to heaven here on earth because of the blessings that God offers to us, he desires to draw us closer to himself through his word. How can a young man cleanse his way? Not by sitting out on the mountainside and looking at the beauty of the snow-capped hills, but by taking heed according to your word. We need something more than what nature offers. 
what nature can provide through the natural knowledge of God. We need to be connected to God, and more importantly, we need to be connected to His Word. When the children of Israel set aside God's Word, they fell into sin. They lost the blessings that God desired to give to them. But when they were connected to God's word, when God raised up the prophets or godly kings and opened up the doors of the temple for the people to worship, then there was a change in the people and God's blessings followed. God's word connects us to God, to the blessings that he offers to us. It reveals what God's will is for his people. Again, the psalmist says, how can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Let me not wander from your commandments. Where is it that we find God speaking to us? Giving us direction for our lives? In his word, in his commandments. It is there that the Lord feeds us. He says, this is where you can find me. In my word. The psalmist goes on and he says in verse 11, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Some English translations use a different word for the Hebrew. The Hebrew word is shamar, which has the idea of to treasure. So literally, your word I have treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you. The word shamar is used by the people of the Old Testament to describe something that's important to them and they build a boundary or maybe a fence around it in order to protect it. This is the concept that the psalmist wants us to go away with when it comes to God's word. That God's word is so valuable to us that we desire to protect it, to guard it. We treasure it and as a result we want to make sure that nothing happens to it. It is something that's important to us. And it is this word of God, which not only connects us to God and his blessings, but it is God's word alone which is able to offer us the cleansing for our sin. The psalmist asks in the opening verse of our text, how can a young man cleanse his way? Remember, we can find out very easily, either by simply looking at nature or by studying God's word, that we live in a fallen world both the natural knowledge of the creation and the revealed knowledge of God in the creation reveal that we have a problem. That the world that we live in, as Paul told us in Romans 8, is struggling under the burden and the consequence of sin. Where is the solution for that? How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. There's only one place where we can find what we need for cleansing from the problem of sin. And not just the sin of the world, but my sin. Where can a young man go to find cleansing for his ways? The word of God. Taking heed according to your word. John says the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. It is the word that reveals what it is that Jesus has done who he was, what he has accomplished in order to redeem mankind from sin and from death. God's word alone offers us what we so desperately need. And this is something that the psalmist emphasizes needs to be instilled at a young age. How can a young man cleanse his way? It doesn't mean that women or old men can't find cleansing, that it's limited only to young men, but the idea is that this is something that needs to be instilled from youth, that the cleansing that we need is something that God alone is able to offer through His Son. God's Word connects us to Himself. It connects us to the blessings that He offers to us through His Word and through His sacraments. And because it offers those blessings that we need in this fallen world, it is something that deserves our careful contemplation, study, and regular use. The psalmist goes on in our text. In verse 12, he says, Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. The word statutes is another synonym for the word of God. 
our prayer in this psalm is that God would teach us, that he would instruct us, that we would learn from his word about who we are, about what our need is, about what God has done, about who he is, and how he has accomplished that deliverance from sin and from death. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. We should desire to come before God's word, to learn, to be taught by it about the problem of our sin as well as the solution that God has provided through his own son and his death on the cross. And this word, which we should desire to learn and be instructed by, is something that we also declare or teach to others. In verse 13, the psalmist goes on, with my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. It's a pretty amazing thing what the psalmist tells us here. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I think all of us would agree that as we study God's word, we realize that there is more in God's word than we can ever completely know or understand in our lifetimes. There are things that we have learned in the past and have forgotten. And there are also things that we have never learned and continue to learn and grow in our knowledge as we study God's word. When the psalmist says, with my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth, we might say, well, I could never get to that standard. And that's true, but it should be our desire. It should be our goal to continue to strive to learn, to be taught by God's word, that we might know the teachings of God's word that en enable us to then teach that word, to proclaim, to speak that word with our lips to those who do not know his word. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. God's word is worthy to be shared with others, to be learned by us so that it can be proclaimed and shared with those that we come into contact with. And it is this word of God which assures us of the cleansing that is found in the blood of Jesus this word that reminds us of all that God has done in order to provide and care for us throughout the daily difficulties that we face throughout life, that also assures us of the joy and the comfort that we need as we journey through a world burdened by sin. The last couple of verses of our text emphasize the idea of joy, which is our theme. The, the psalmist says in verse 14, I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. We aren't all that unlike the children of Israel in the Old Testament. As human beings, we have a tendency when things get tough in our lives, when we, when we struggle with things in our life, to let the one thing that can give us joy and comfort, encouragement and strength to continue on doing the things that we need to do, that God desires us to do, that's the one thing that we push to the back burner. We stop picking up the Bible and reading it. We stop going to Bible class. We stop bringing our kids to Sunday school. We stop attending church. All of those things, those things, we get frustrated. Maybe we get frustrated with God and we want to blame God for the things that we're struggling with. Or we think that by removing ourselves from God's word, that things will get better. They never do. It is only through being connected to God and his word that we can overcome the frustrations, the troubles, the trials, the grief, whatever it is that we're struggling with in this life and get back to the comfort and the joy that the Lord alone is able to give to us through his word. The psalmist says, I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. It all comes back to the word. It is the word through the Old and the New Testament that God has so graciously given to his people in order to encourage us in this fallen world, to remind us of the problem of our sin, yes, 
but also to point us to the solution for that sin in the person and work of Jesus. That whole plan of salvation in the Old Testament all culminated when Jesus finally was sent into the world, born of a virgin, in order to redeem <coughs> us from sin and from death. And that gift is not only given to you and to me, but to all people through faith. God's desire is to bring us out of the pilgrimage of this fallen, sinful, barren world to the joys of His eternal kingdom in heaven. And along the way, He offers us all of the things that we need. He feeds us. He protects us. He comforts us. He encourages us through His Word and through His sacrament. God's Word is indeed the Christian's joy. It is there that we too can rejoice in the blessings that God offers to us, that we can delight in His Word and in His promises to us and to all people, where we can find the comfort that we need in the troubles as we journey through this fallen world. May the Lord indeed lead us to see where our true joy is to be found in His Word and the promises that He makes to us, in pointing us to Jesus, the one whose blood cleanses us from all sin. May we continue to delight, to rejoice in, to make use of God's word, which is for our eternal good. In Jesus' name, amen. Please rise. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. for prayer. This morning, in addition to our general prayer, we'll also bring prayers on behalf of the Mission Helper team that left last Sunday and is working their way through Nepal, sharing the message of Jesus with a lot of the children in that country, which is largely unchristian. We pray. O oh Lord God, 
our King eternal, our light, and our salvation. We, your children, seek you now in prayer and ask that you would rest your hand in blessing upon us. Bless us, O Lord, with such faith in your Son, Jesus, that we might believe in him with all our hearts, and trusting alone in his work, may have the assurance of everlasting life. Grant us grace to bring forth fruits of faith also in our own lives for your great glory. Keep us always within your care. Be with us in times of danger and peril. When we face trials in this life, we ask that you would remind us of the consequences of our sin, but that those things that we face in this life are not worthy to be compared with the joys that await us in heaven. Make your face to shine upon your people everywhere so that through our work, the light of your truth might shine in all the world. We pray this morning for the mission helpers who have journeyed to Nepal. We ask that you would continue to watch over them and bless the work that they are doing as they bring your message of light and salvation to a country that is largely in darkness and is ignorant of who you are and what you have done for them. Let your way be known through the mission helpers and throughout all of the earth, bringing your saving health to all people. Let all those who bear witness of your name remain true to your word and allow them to live their lives in godliness and purity. O Lord, we ask that you would also be gracious to our families, that our children might grow in wisdom and stature and in favor with both God and men. Give your Holy Spirit to fathers, to mothers, as well as to the children among us, that we might all be equipped with greater knowledge of your word and live in grateful obedience to it. Dear Lord, in any trial of this life, grant us your peace. Show yourself to us as an ever-present help in our time of need, giving us wisdom and understanding, wholeness of mind and body, courage and hope. All of these requests we bring to you, O Lord. We ask for them not on the basis of our own worthiness, but rather on the basis of Christ's perfect life and his sacrificial death in our place. It is in his name that we ask all of these things, and in his name in which we also join to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated. We'll conclude with the singing of the final hymn, hymn 376. Amen.